It's always late evening dark in here, but I've got friends sitting to the left and right of me, and there's music. Friends might be the wrong word. They're people I trust, really trust. Like, I know that they would walk through fire for me. I know because we've practiced it. Walking through fire for each other with actual fire. If a guy will put on six layers of clothes and go stand in a 500 degree room for you, you can trust him. I call these men brother, even though they're not my family. Except that they are my family, just not the kind of family where I know their wives' names or how old their kids are. The music we listen to isn't what I'd set up a Pandora channel for. It's really just information being passed on the radio with an occasional crypto screech, like something from a Philip Glass concerto, which I definitely don't want to create a Pandora channel for. <laughs> Still, it's music. Satellite data jazz, man. Chief LaPlume called it the Blue Light Lounge, and we all slump in front of our consoles and gazing into orange screens, getting wasted on radar scope dope. Waiting. Recruiters will not tell you about the waiting. We wait for everything. I mostly wait for my relief. I trust my relief with my life, but I don't trust him to get up on time. So I keep an eye on the clock. Every damn day. When there's a gap in the music, the conversation flows. OS2 Greenup likes orchestrating lists of things, like all the slang terms we can think of for vagina. Our list of things for penis. <laughs> Took days to finish and <laughs> ended up being 150 items long. Because my brothers are 12. <laughs> So it's not unusual when the watch officer suddenly screams, Jesus Christ, Heine, put your clothes on! <laughs> Greenup had suggested that OS2 Heine didn't have the balls to stand the rest of his watch naked. One does not decline a challenge in the Blue Light Lounge. Sometimes there's mail. Actual mail, which I'd call snail mail if snails could swim. When it gets quiet, which is rare, you'll find one or two of the guys reading a letter. On this particular night, I have mail from home. The date on the postmark is from three weeks ago. Email is not a thing yet. It's thick. And that's exciting. Lots of news from home. Not really. It's a two-page letter, front and back of one page, so really a page and a half, and there's a bundle of pages from Consumer Reports. A small part of me knows that she didn't mean to annoy me, but the rest of me, the rest of me is annoyed. Her letter begins with a complaint that I have not been holding up my end of the conversation as if one can have a conversation with six weeks between responses. She hasn't been receiving enough letters from me, she says, though she doesn't tell me how many letters she wants. I feel defensive and guilty. I haven't written as often as I would like, but my silence has been justified. For most of January, no mail was permitted on or off the ship operational security. It makes sense. We had just launched 10 Tomahawk missiles into Iraq, destroying Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons program. I wrote 11 pages about it, determined to make up for what I knew would be an uncomfortable silence. 
I wrote in detail about how it felt to do the job we'd trained for. I wrote about the adrenaline rush, the dead serious moments, the quiet, the roar of the missile boosters, the scramble to launch an extra missile when a tomahawk from another ship exploded over their heads, the raucous celebration by shipmates who had merely stood by and watched, the football game on television with nachos and near beer on the mess decks, the halftime interruption when the White House press secretary announced what we'd done. I wrote about getting the horrifying news that a missile had fallen into a hotel lobby, about not knowing if it was our missile, about not knowing if it was my missile. Eleven pages. I ticked the weeks off on my fingers. Our letters must have passed each other in the mail. I feel better, though later, months later, I will not. Most of the rest of her letter is a treatise why I should abandon my plan to buy a new car when I get home. It's a plan we had agreed to when I let her talk me into selling my truck before deployment. I decide not to mention it when I write back because it'll be six weeks before I can read her response and by then we'll be almost home. The pages from Consumer Reports are, to her, the final word on the subject. There's no use in arguing. The last paragraph of her letter stops my heart. She tells me she spent a wonderful weekend in Mexico riding horses on the beach with a friend. She means a male friend. Suspicion ripples my thoughts, making it feel as though I'm viewing the world from underwater except that I can breathe. I don't respond to the letter from home. I can't think of anything to say. We pass through the Strait of Hormuz and head for home. The ship lurches through heavy seas and except for the poor bastard who's never managed to get his sea legs, we're happy. The Blue Light Lounge smells like strong coffee and weak vomit, so maybe not entirely happy. <laughs> Relieved. Relieved is a much better word. We are home, and we are six weeks from home. In Hong Kong, I search for a payphone. The very idea of the coming conversation makes me uneasy. Against all hope, the call goes through. I ask about Mexico. She tells me it's nothing. I ask her directly, are you sleeping with him? She laughs and puts our daughter on the phone. Heidi is four, and the sound of her voice makes me giddy. And then she talks mostly about the new man in her life, the new man in her mother's life. I feel dizzy and nauseous three weeks from home. There isn't much for me to do in the blue light lounge, so I mostly sit with my hands in my coat pockets, collar turned up against the chill of the air conditioning, and think about my new car. If my brothers notice me brooding, they don't say anything. I want to hate them, at least a little. They are my home, and I have to leave them soon, and it will hurt too much if I love them when I go. I convince myself that they are the reason my marriage is ending. The reason my marriage has ended. The home I'm returning to doesn't exist anymore. I need a new home. A 1993 Ford Probe GT. Steel blue. My wife and I will stop at the mile of cars on our way home the day I arrive. I know to the dollar how much I'll spend. I know because of consumer reports. <laughs> Two weeks from home. We stop in Pearl Harbor to pick up fathers and sons, brothers and nephews, guests who will ride the ship home with us. My father is among them. He knows something is wrong, but I don't tell him. I can't tell him. Have no idea what words to use to tell him that his son is a failure and cannot love. Nine days from home, 
At sea, there are air shows and flybys and great thumping walls of water. There are guests who want tours, sea stories, gunnery demonstrations, steel beach picnics and burgers and water balloons, and nine last days at nights at home in the Blue Light Lounge. In the Blue Light Lounge, my father sits next to me and we talk about everything but that my marriage is failing, has already failed weeks ago, and I am still 24 hours from beginning the two years it will take for me to learn I could have done nothing to stop it. The music in the Blue Light Lounge is buoyant. My brothers are laughing with their sons and their fathers. A warm cacophony. I sit beside my father with my hands in my coat pocket, still not talking about that first view of her in the crowd on the pier. Not talking about that first embrace. Talking about my new car. We talk about philosophy, about duty and honor and time away from home. I am at home and eight hours from home. I transfer in a week, and though I don't want to leave, I have to, and so I just want to get it over with. I have to leave home to go home. The crowd is on the pier, of course, and they are joyfully noisy. She is not among them, not at first. Later, she will admit that she cannot bring herself to leave her lover's bed. But right now, I can only wonder, even though I know, I know. I have known for weeks. The crowds are still there, at least, when she arrives, gloriously, colorfully late. She greets me with a smile and a hug, and later, I'll see that it looked pretty convincing on camera. We go home, my wife, my daughter, my father, and me. We do not stop at the mile of cars. My father arranges for my wife and me to have a few hours alone. She pours shots of tequila. It is not a celebration. Afterwards, I feel like a chore. I know that I will fail to be what she wants, just as I always have. She insists that I buy a used Honda Civic instead of the new probe she agreed to seven months ago. So I did. Two weeks later, in her brother's kitchen, her family asks about the tomahawk strike they saw on CNN in January. Was it you? Yes, I reply. Didn't Kim tell you? All eyes turn to her. I don't know what you do, she says. What about my letter? She shrugs, dismisses it and me with a wave of her hand. Less than a week later, on my way home from work, I say, fuck it, out loud, and stop at the mile of cars to buy that goddamn Ford Probe GT. <laughs> it is steel blue, and it reminds me of my home in the Blue Light Lounge. I traded in the Civic deliberately accepting less for it than she wanted. I pissed her off, but I wanted to. She demanded to know why I bought the car, and I told her that it was I wanted it because of consumer reports. On the day she drove away with our children, I opened a filing cabinet and found a letter. It is unopened, but I know it is 11 pages long. Give it for Kurt.